application architecture with .NET. And in this section, what we're going to talk about is basically how you should be developing applications as a whole in your, in your uh, companies. Uh, we're going to learn how all these different .NET technologies are used in this architecture. First thing I want to talk about is users. Is a user is a four-letter word. Always remember that. They're the, they're, if they didn't exist, my life would be much more happier, but I wouldn't have a job either because they do weird stuff like clicking and going the wrong places that I didn't think they would go and blowing up the program and stuff like that. Here's how users look at your program, right? Whether it be a website or an executable or a Windows Phone application or whatever, actually they probably only see the first part, right? Which is the user interface. That's what the user sees in most cases. So that's the user interface. Now all, all programs have to have logic in it too, right, of course. That's why they pay us the big bucks, right, to write that logic. And then um, most, most, if not all, programs have some sort of data in it, whether it's internal data on a file system, from a database, from around the world, whatever. It has some type of data that it got and put it in there somehow, right? And even if you're a game, you have data, right? You have data, 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 data. Um, this is how most programs are designed, right? Uh, user interface logic and data, right? This is how your user sees your program. User interface and magic. Actually, I would say my program managers see the same thing. <laughs> This is how your user perceives your application. User interface where they click and browse back and forth and magic, right? That's why users have no idea how hard it is to do those other two pieces, right? Because they just think it's magic. You can just whip that up. PMs are the same way. Your application hopefully is way more complicated than that, right? Especially if you, if you have a large enterprise application, an overview of how any application really should be written in the end, right? So uh, those of you who have programmed before, have you ever written a program where everything was in one EXE? And if you don't raise your hand, you're lying. Because <laughs> I do it all the time for test applications, right? Uh, but the first program I ever wrote, I did this. The user interface, the data logic, the logic, the data, everything was in one executable, right? And for small applications, that's totally cool. Yes, I have written programs like that, but that doesn't work in the business world, which all of you are working in. We really shouldn't be writing apps like this, ever, 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 unless, like I said, they're just a test app or something like that. Um, here's how most people nowadays write their application. Really what we write now is we write a presentation layer, which is the UI, right? what the users click quietly on, right? Whether it be a web page or a Windows executable. The business layer, which contains all the logic, like we saw in the first slide, which contains all the logic. And then we have a data access layer to go against the database, right? So uh, why would we separate, why not do the one thing? Why do we separate, separate out these three things? Maintainability, what else? Refactoring, yeah, maintainability, refactoring, kind of the same thing. So. You know, if there's a problem in this layer, I just need to fix this and put it up, right? Or install it, right? I don't need to fix the rest of them. Reusability. So one of, remember I told you one of my big pet peeves is reusability. So if you have your business logic reusable, you can reuse it in other applications. Independency. So, you know, and, and if you're in a larger, you know, development department except for one person, <laughs> you know, it makes it way easier to work on these different layers, right, uh, with different developers or different teams. It's a lot easier to, to code against these and check them out and code and put it back in and stuff like that. What's another reason anybody can think of? Security can be, you can place different security on these different layers, that's true. Redundancy, so if you're, if you're talking about what I'm, what I'm thinking is that, um, especially when you're talking about uh, web layers and things like that, is what's the best way to get more performance out of your application, right? You split it and put it on multiple machines, right? So if you have a web machine here 
and it's really pounding the business logic layer that you can just move that on a, you can spread it out on the different machines and get way more processing for your bang for your buck, right? Same thing with the data access layer. You can move it to different machines. But if it's all in one layer, you can't move it to different machines, right? And, and, and even when you're talking about the uh, Windows world, and we'll go and talk more about this in the next portion, is that this can just be on the user's machine. The rest of it could be somewhere else, right? Totally can do that if you segment it out like this, but not if you do it the first way. So this, in the end, is really how your application should be written in the end. The first layer you can see, we don't even call presentation layer, we call UX layer. And UX stands for user experience. I'm really glad I worked for the first company in my programming career that actually has a user experience team. Because guess who's usually the user experience team at companies? Are we good at writing UI? Hell no. I can always spot a program written by a programmer because it's ugly, it's hard to use, it's gray, not intuitive, nothing what the user wants. Layer. And the UX layer should be very, very, very thin, hardly anything in it, right? And the UX, and because when you do this now, what's the big benefit, right? Is, I mean, I, I, I know a lot of you aren't programmers before, I don't care what your managers say, they are lying to you. And I try not to say lying anymore, because I think somebody above them is lying, <laughs> right? Because you, you, you're going to, they, they want an app, and they go, well, we want a web app or Windows app. I go, okay, I'll write a Windows app. But I think in my mind, well, I wonder if we're going to move this to the web someday or if we're going to move it to an iPhone or something like that, right? So I usually code like that anyway, but the managers don't, right? They are very single-focused. They don't think about these things because inevitably they'll come back six months later and go, oh, man, we need an iPhone app. And you go, too bad, because we've put everything in here. And we're going to have a big development time to do that, right? So uh, this is where the UX layer comes. It's basically a very, very thin layer developed for that device, right? Whether it be an iPhone, a Windows app, Silverlight app, web app, mobile device, some iPad, whatever, it doesn't matter. That's what the UX layer is. Very, very thin, hardly really does anything except for bring up the UI, okay? Under that is really where you put the presentation layer, more of what happens when you click wildly and stuff like that, because that can re be all reusable, right? You can, you can reuse that code. I mean, a person clicks on a button in the iPhone and clicks on a Windows app, it's not much different, right? Something is happening, right? But we move that more down here so it can be reused by UX layers. Um, the next layer is the communication layer, right? I, I, we hardly write any programs now that doesn't do some kind of communication, whether it be through the web, through TCP, through something like that. That's how we get our data remoted one place to another. We really don't write applications that are tightly connected to the backend source anymore. Really, really bad, 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 bad way of writing applications, right? Um, so we have some kind of communications layer that communicates between this, the, between and then to the business layer and the data access layer, okay? So as you can see, um, again, these are really easy to change and spread out onto multiple servers and, and spread your load. So this is the model to create flexible, reusable applications. Uh, if, you, if you architect like this, believe me, uh, your company will, and your product will be much better much easier to maintain it, and, and not only maintain, but respond to changes faster. Because what do we want? We want to write good code that aren't, isn't buggy and stuff like that. What do managers want? Feature, 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 right? And if you don't stuff, do stuff like this, feature, feature, feature is going to be feature, feature, feature. See what I'm saying? So it doesn't work unless you go, don't go to this model. You don't need to modify the layers, I've said that before. And you don't need to rewrite an entire application again, right? So if you write an entire application in ASP.NET, guess what? The iPhone comes along or something else, you have to rewrite it so the iPhone can use it. So it just doesn't work. So why tiers? We separate the logic and data access from presentation. Like I've said before, easier to maintain. Low coupling. You're going to hear this a lot in your programming career, especially nowadays, is we're trying to get 
lower and lower coupling between these layers or even between types or between anything really. Type, uh, layers and DLLs and types should not be aware of anything else. And that's what we call low coupling because it's way easier for them to be reused easily by doing low coupling. Um, so very, very important. Uh, you know, I come from a day where we did tight coupling and it was just hard all the time. Modularity, uh, reuse business logic. Like I said, you don't want to keep rewriting business logic. This also allows us to do better team development. Like I said before in the other slide, it allows us to break this up, not only in different teams, but allow different programmers to be working on these things separately and independently from the other. So uh, the UX layer, we talked about this already. This really um, is, is the user experience layer. Um, uh, it's a way for users to interact with the application itself. They render and format data for display to users and acquire and validate data for the end users. That's really all the UX layer does, right? It's basically display, validate, well, even validation go in different layers too, but then send the data somewhere else to be used by a different layer. User experience uh, usually is it's just this part, which usually just contains UI components, right? Just the stuff the user sees, that's all. The presentation layer helps synchronize or orchestrate the user interactions between the other layers, between, well, the next layer down. Um, can be useful to drive the process using separate user process components, avoids hard coding the process flow and state management, okay? Um, this is really important. You can even use Windows workflow to, to orchestrate this process workflow. Of course, the big important now uh, piece nowadays is uh, the communications layer, which sits under the user experience layer or the presentation layer, um, sends data to and from the back end. However, this data is being sent, HTTP, HTTPS, TCP, name pipes, whatever it takes, that's what the communications layer is in charge of and only in charge of. We have our business layer, of course, which implements business logic for the application, regardless of whether the business process consists of a single step or orchestrated workflow. Okay? Again, we can use workflow here, like credit card processing. That's a workflow. Um, that can all be separated down into the business layer with workflow, components, and business entities, which is part of the data layer, is the part right above the data layer to represent your uh, data as actual objects, like a person object, an order object, things like that. And then we have our data access layer. Uh, data access components abstract the logic necessary to access your underlying data source. So again, another, an, another great reason we do this is for a couple reasons. One is, like I said, we can easily you know, spread this across different servers, right? But the other cool thing is, if you get bought out by a company who likes Oracle and you were using SQL Server, <laughs> which I've seen, right? All you have to do is change this layer. You don't have to change the entire programming stack or the entire layer stack. You just change one layer and boom, you're using Oracle. I've done a project like that before, right? So that's another great reason you can separate out the data access layer. And you can have multiple data access layers too. So how do we use all this with .NET? The user experience layer with .NET consists of the UI components, just like I said in the other uh, slide, right? Which are Windows Forms, which are the older you know, way of, for instance, .NET 1 to do things. Windows Presentation Foundation WPF, which is the way we do the newer UI um, in uh, Vista and above. Um, ASP.NET, which are all of our web you know, applications, including AJAX and MVC type of applications. Now we have Silverlight, um, you know, which works on my Mac and works on Linux and stuff like that. We can, we can have app, not only media application, but full-blown, really cool applications using Silverlight. And that's part of our user experience layer. We have Windows Mobile, of course, and now we, I keep forgetting to put it on here, uh, Windows Phone 7, which is for the new Windows um, phone. In the .NET world, this is where all the uh, user experience lives. And the presentation layer here lives here too. There's really no specific .NET components for that because that's just coding that you do. In the newer versions of .NET Visual Studio, we can have local storage cache. One of the things we can really improve performance is by caching things locally, right? Instead of going and get the same freaking data over and over again, 
right? We can cache that locally. It's really easy to do with the later versions of .NET and Visual Studio. Then we have our communications layer, which is between these two layers, right? So we have Windows Communication Foundation, uh, WCF Data Services, uh, Web Services, uh, Sync Services, Azure Cloud, right? Everything's going to the cloud, to the cloud, right? And uh, so we have cloud storage. Well, we have cloud communication now, too. And I'm sure you guys are using the cloud, don't even know it. Has anybody gone to Bing? Bing.com? The whole thing's on the cloud, entire thing. So you're using the cloud. We have something called RIA services, which is uh, really built for uh, Silverlight and WPF. And then we have workflow services. And we have our business layer, which consists of, uh, also consists of business workflow, with the Windows for Workflow Foundation. Um, we have business components, which are basically the stuff you write, including validation and things like that. And we have business entities, which are basically the, our, our types that represent our data we really put in the business layer. And I put T4 templates now because that's a new capability of .NET 4 to do auto code generation. So what it can look at is like an NED framework model and auto gen code classes for it. Every time you change it, it'll auto gen the code for you. It's really kind of cool stuff. Uh, the data access layer, which is any framework, linked to SQL, which kind of died in six months, and then data sets, which is the older way. You know, we're moving more towards any framework.